Turn to the fourth chapter of Luke, and we're going to be working through verses 14 through 21, and uh, we're going to begin with verse 14 through 16. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. Now, remember the context. Jesus has just completed 40 days in the desert. He didn't eat for 40 days. He was tested every one of those days, and and we have been dealing with those, those temptations of Christ. But now that he has come back, he is empowered. He's, he's full of the power of the Holy Spirit. He speaks with authority. And everywhere he goes throughout Galilee, people are amazed by the Holy Spirit power that just oozes out of him. His words, his demeanor, his wisdom, his teaching, everything about Jesus is turning heads. And the news about him is spreading pretty quickly. So there, here in verse 16 then, he comes home. He comes back to his hometown in Nazareth. He goes into the synagogue. It's on the Sabbath. And the scripture tells us that he stood up. Why did he stand up? Because in the ancient Jewish tradition of synagogue worship, there were basically six components. There, it would start with the Shema, would be recited, beginning with the words, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And then there would be a series of prayers, followed by the reading from the law, a reading from the prophets, then instruction on the passages read, and finally, a benediction. So after the reading of Law and Prophets, the tradition was that any man within the synagogue could stand up and give instruction. And that's how he would be identified. He could stand up. There had to be at least 10 men present in the synagogue in order for this to take place. But that's why it's significant that Jesus stands up in the synagogue. He is recognizing, or he's being recognized, and and he's saying, you know, pass me the Bible. I'm ready to teach. And so let's, let's hear what happens next. Verses 17 through 21. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now you have to understand what this scripture is. This is Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. It's a very famous passage. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Everyone in that synagogue could have recited those two verses by heart. Okay? Very famous passage of scripture within that context. Why? Because this is a messianic prophecy. And the whole civilization known as Israel for centuries had been waiting for the, for the revealing of who this Messiah was going to be. Everybody knew this text. And Jesus points to the text and he says, today, right here in little old Nazareth, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Translation, I am the Messiah. Now you have to understand that There were a lot of messianic prophecies in the Bible. And Jesus could have chose any passage that he wanted to at the moment when he was handed the scrolls and said, you know, I want to read. He chose this passage because not only does it give him the opportunity to verbally say, I am the Messiah, I am fulfilling the scripture, but he's also saying, I'm taking on that messianic mission statement. This is not only who I am, but it's what I do. I am the Messiah, and you'll know that I'm the Messiah because I will fulfill this prophecy. I will be anointed with the Spirit of God. I will preach good news to the poor. I will proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. I will release the oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And from this point forward, through the rest of the Gospel of Luke, everything's gonna point back to these two verses. This is what Jesus does. All of the healing stories, all of the the stories of the blind receiving sight, 
of all of his gospel teaching, it all comes from this messianic mission statement. This is what I do, and you will know that I'm the Messiah by what I say and the impact that it creates on people, and not just any people, but particularly in the lives of the poor, the sick, brokenhearted, enslaved, prisoners, blind, and the oppressed. In fact, later in Luke 7, John sends his disciples say, just want to make sure, you know, Jesus, you are the Messiah, right? And Jesus says, go back and report to John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is preached to the poor. I told you what I was going to do, and I've been doing it, and if you wonder who I am, I am the Messiah, and here's the proof. Look at the lives of people. Look at the lives of the people whom I've touched. And, and the proof is in the pudding. That is very, very important in Luke's gospel. Now, let me remind you of something. We're just going to bring this into modern day. Let me just remind you of something. Jesus is not dead. This is not old, ancient news. As Christians, we believe that Jesus is alive. And if the mission statement in Luke 4 was true then to what Jesus says, I'm going to do, then it stands to reason that he's still doing these things that we just read in Luke 4, 18 through 19. In other words, we can still expect to see Jesus doing what he said he would be doing, proclaiming good news to the poor, freedom for the prisoners, restoring sight for the blind, liberating the press, setting captives free. This is the business, this is the mission of what Jesus does. And for a brief period in history, he did it in the flesh, and we have all these wonderful stories that shows us that he did these things. But since his resurrection, how does Jesus go about accomplishing his mission? Through the church, through the body of Christ. And so you know where I'm going with this, right? If the mission of Jesus Christ was to preach good news to the poor and set captives free, if the mission of Christ was to liberate the oppressed and comfort the brokenhearted, then it stands to reason that the mission of the body of Christ called his church will be exactly the same mission. People who are passionate, selfless followers of Christ, disciples of Christ, will be those who are filled with the Holy Spirit and committed to the same messianic mission. And the evidence of Christ in us and with us will be obvious for the world to see. They'll see the evidence in what we do and the effect it creates in people around us. And not just any people, but particularly the poor, the sick, the brokenhearted, the enslaved, prisoners, blind, and the oppressed. Because that's what Jesus says his business was. That's his mission. If there is no obvious evidence to be found in the lives of those Christ came to serve, if there's no obvious evidence in the lives of those within the influence of the local church, as described in Luke 4, 18 and 19, the church may think that it is about a great many things, but one thing will be obvious and certain, that Christ is not working in that place. Because if Christ is at work in this church and in us and through us, then good news will be preached to the poor, and so on and so forth. You see how that works, right? So last Thursday, uh, not this past Thursday, Thursday week ago, I got onto a plane to go to Haiti with a team of 13 people, and I had a singular mission, having spent so much time recently in Luke and certainly preparing this message uh, that I thought I was going to be able to preach last week uh, for you, and it didn't work out. I was so in tune to say, where is Christ at work? What is the evidence is good news being preached to the poor? Aren't the captives being set free? Is the love of God in Jesus Christ evident in what's happening in Haiti, particularly in the places where we have invested as a church in this partnership with Global Orphan Project in the care of orphans? And I want to tell you, it didn't take me very long <laughs> to recognize the evidence. And I'll just skip to the end. Yes, Christ is very much at work in Haiti through colonial through the Global Orphan Project and many, many other Christ followers uh, in that country. It is a compelling situation there. Now, Colonial and Global Orphan Project had been present in Haiti uh, for some time prior to January 12, 2010, but after the earthquake, our activity 
and engagement with this country increased dramatically. You'll remember, like many churches all throughout the world, as soon as we heard about this devastating earthquake, we took a, a, an offering and we sent $38,000 um, very quickly to relief efforts through the Global Orphan Project. Then later, last fall, when Peter Maseko was here from Malawi, Africa, and gave us a compelling message, and we had an Orphan Sunday in emphasis again, once again, you as the church gave very generously to that. And over the course of this past year, since the earthquake, we sent several teams down there. Uh, mine was not the first by any stretch. And so what I want to do uh, this morning is I want to show you where I saw Christ at work on my trip in Haiti. And I also want to show you where some of your investment in generosity has gone in very practical ways. Before I do, though, I understand that there are many, perhaps, who are new to Colonial, uh, perhaps you uh, are visiting with us today, you're not familiar with some of these terms. So very quickly, a little background. The Global Orphan Project began in 2003. It came as a result uh, of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the generosity of Mike and Beth Fox. Uh, Mike and Beth are not members of our church, but they are leading Christian members of our community, very, very generous people. In recent years, three men from Colonial have taken key leadership positions on the staff of the GO Project. It's one of the reasons that we have such a close connection with this ministry. Our own Adrian Lewis, who is a member at our Quivira campus, serves on uh, the Global Orphan Project staff, and I'm just gonna call it the GO Project to make things go a little quicker here. Um, he was the trip leader for our group that recently went to Haiti. Uh, you need to know that the GO Project is an unapologetically Christ-centered, biblically-based organization. This is not a general orphan ministry. This is a very specific Christ-centered, biblically-based organization. The GO Project has a unique model of orphan care, and it's important that you understand this because it really has a lot to do with why we're so invested in it. Their model of orphan care is based upon a partnership with a local indigenous church. The whole orphan village is created around the church, the pastor of the church, and the relationship between partnering churches in America and the indigenous church and its leadership on the ground in Haiti. I don't know of any other orphan ministry that has that particular kind of model. It's very, very appealing uh, to me, and I think what I want to tell you is I think that's working. That part of it is, is very compelling. So far, since 2003, the Global Orphan Project currently hosts 45 orphan villages in 14 different countries, bringing hope and care to over 3,500 children. Now, in 2008, the elders of this church uh, since the vision being given to us by the Lord, we called it Give It Away, and part of that vision was to engage in, into this orphan ministry, rescuing orphans. We felt we had a very organic relationship with Global Orphan Project, and that was the vehicle by which we were gonna get in the game with what God was doing in rescuing orphans around the world. And so um, since that time, <clears throat> in 2008, we have established projects in Haiti, in Kenya, and Malawi. And I will be heading to Africa in a few weeks to check on our projects in Malawi and Kenya. But I wanted, to, uh, for the rest of this time, to just kind of brief you and help you to understand how things are developing in Haiti. In Haiti, the GO Project has 19 different villages, and we have just under 2,000 orphans in our care just in Haiti. So this has really been where the global orphans started and began a deep investment and it's obvious because we have so many orphans under our care there, and of course, that number increased dramatically uh, following the earthquake. The team that I went with consisted of 13 people. Five of those people were from Colonial. Others came from all over the country. We flew in on a Thursday. We came back on a Monday. Our excursion was called a vision trip because the intent is to help people to be exposed to how Christ is working in the lives of orphans and abandoned children through the GO Project and its partners. So how, how did I see Christ at work? I'm gonna point out four specific areas that I saw Christ at work in a very, very compelling way. And because I'm the preacher, I'm doing all the talking. I wish I had the rest of the team up here, but I gotta go quickly if I'm gonna cover all this ground. First, I saw Christ working in the lives of orphaned and abandoned children. You think you're going to go work with them and you understand that through them, Christ is working on you. Uh, as soon as the bus stops, in one of these orphan villages, the kids are gathered around uh, and you are just surrounded by beautiful smiles and, and hugs and open hearts and open arms. There was one little boy 
uh, who kind of snagged me just as soon as I was about to get off the bus. His name was Erickson. He was 10 years old. There's Erickson. And uh, as I was just walking around and he was showing me, you know, where he sleeps and all of that, I'm thinking, I have a 10-year-old boy. And, and, and just imagining my son Levi in the sandals of little Erickson was pretty humbling and powerful experience. Every member of our team was overwhelmed by these children's capacity to love and to receive love. And we saw that as a very strong evidence of Christ uh, being present in the midst of these children. Secondly, I saw Christ at work in all of the people who are part of this organization called the Global Orphan Project. Our trip leader was Adrian Lewis, as I mentioned. He's a member of our church. Adrian, right off the bat, really put it on us. He said, I want each person on this trip to define what it means to be rich. And then he asked each of us to consider whether or not we were rich. That definition and that answer changed over the course of our trip. He showed us James 1.27 that says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Those words took on greater and greater meaning over the course of this trip. And then there's Pastor Moïse Faval. Pastor Moïse is an indigenous Haitian. He's a pastor. Uh, he has a church in the very heart of Port-au-Prince. When the earthquake hit, uh, he lost one of his sons, and he also lost his church that crumbled to the ground. Since then, his church has been rebuilt. Uh, that's where you saw me preaching earlier in the video. Uh, his passion for Haiti, his passion for his people, his passion for the orphans and bringing people to Christ is so contagious and so strong, just a tremendous God-honoring leader. Uh, and he serves as the regional director in Haiti for the Global Orphan Project now. Third, I saw Christ at work in the Haitians, particularly those who've been raised up to serve as pastors, overseers, and, and adult leaders within the orphan villages. We saw Haitian women who served as mamas to the orphans. And every one of these women seemed to be unusually beautiful, well-dressed, focused, well-educated, and very committed to their calling. It was shocking to me what quality people were, were there doing this work. We met Haitian school teachers. In the, each, each village has a school. And these teachers are brilliant and doing a fantastic job, great control of the classrooms, and the kids are learning, many of them learning multiple languages right there in these orphan villages. Uh, we met Haitian church members. These church members were... <laughs> They're a very serious group of people. They are very dedicated, very committed to the ministry uh, that they were called to. We uh, got a chance to spend time with your average Haitian citizens, with, with the pastors and leaders and mamas. And let me tell you something about the Haitian people. They are a beautiful people. They are a very hardworking and very intelligent group of people. You must resist judging a nation based upon its gross national product. That would be a tragic mistake. Much of the poverty and problems in Haiti can be traced to a corrupt and unstable government, but the average citizen in Haiti is a very impressive person. They're proud of their country. They, they have a deep and abiding faith in God, the Christians do, and they do not want to be thought of as poor and needy. They are very confident that God is with them and that God will rescue them, that God will bring about change. And, and, and growth in their country, and they're willing to work for it. Now, there's one pastor couple that I want to introduce you to in more depth. The pastor's name is Pastor Kesnell Joseph. His wife's name is Unique. Uh, pastor Kesnell is my age. He's 40. And uh, this couple oversees a village in an area that's called Dargu, uh, Haiti. There's over 65 kids in this village that they oversee. Now, Pastor Kesnell, just a little bit of information about him, he was raised dirt poor in Haiti. And when I say dirt poor, I mean this guy would regularly go day or two days in a row without getting a meal. It's a very, very sad and difficult story that he was raised in. But he was able to catch a boat and make it to America. Um, and it's a long story. But when he was in America, he was able to get his education in New York. He started a small business that ended up becoming a very successful commercial real estate business. Moved down to Florida, married this beautiful woman, Unique. They're living a very standard, upper-middle-class life in America, but for the last couple of years leading up to this point, God has been giving him a vision. 
He's appeared to him in dreams saying, my son, I love you. What are you waiting for? And he had no idea what God was trying to tell him until finally he, it's a long story, but it's a very powerful story. He finally understood God was calling him to go back to Haiti and to love and care for and educate these poor kids, many of who were orphaned and abandoned. And so he sells everything that he has. He and his, his new wife, they move to Haiti and begin building a school from all of the resources that they had earned in America. For three years, they sleep on the flatbed of a pickup truck. Just do the math on that one. And this is, this is who is leading this very amazing project in Dargo. And now, let me tell you a little bit more about Kesnell. Not only is he a pastor of a church in this er- on this property, not only is he overseeing the orphans in the school, He's also a general contractor and owns a construction company. All of that going on at the same time. In 2009, he had a school full of kids. He had 15 orphans that they were housing on the property, had his construction company. Then the earthquake comes. The the school that he had dumped all of his life savings and earnings into has severe cracks and structural damage. The church that was on the end of it is demolished completely. They go from having 15 orphans to 65 orphans within a few days. That's exactly the time that God leads the Global Orphan Project to meet Pastor Kessnell. And before long, he is receiving prayers and volunteers and resources from two American churches, one in Florida and one in Kansas City called Colonial Presbyterian Church. At just the right time, God worked through Colonial to supply the funds necessary for two critical projects, and I'm gonna show you these in just a second. One was to add a second floor to a prior existing building that now would become the school and a dormitory for all 65 boys and girls. And then to build boys' homes and to get the boys out of that place that we just built to a place across the property so the boys and girls are not all right there living on top of each other. So I wanna show you this video. You'll meet Pastor Castanel uh, and you'll get a chance to see where your investment in this orphan project in Haiti is going specifically. This is Pastor Joseph Kessnell. He uh, leads a church here. He and his wife Yannick hello. lead the church and the school and the orphanage and a construction company and water production. All because he feels God has called them back here to care for their own people. Pastor Joseph and his wife uh, run the orphanage here, and the name of this area is Dagu. Dagu. Yes, quite a bouquet. And uh, following the earthquake, there was a great need to create a roof and a, a place for the kids to have school and to sleep. And so the building right behind me is uh, the product of Colonial's uh, generosity in responding to God's call to help orphans. Uh, the whole second floor, and we're gonna go up there in just a minute and look at uh, what the kids are doing there during the day, and I'll just tell you, they uh, study there during the day and they sleep there at night. And so we'll go up there in just a minute. Uh, Our church in the U.S. called Colonial built this building for you, and on behalf of our church, we just wanna say that we love you and we pray for you, and we hope that you'll study hard and uh, go on to do great things for your country and for God. Amen? All right. OK. Nous avons entendu ça que Colonial, l'église coloniale aux États-Unis voulait aider l'école pour que nous capables de construire, pour nous créer une place qui a plus de sécurité. Nous pas contents? Oui. Hein? On va avoir un bon plan, mais vous savez. All right. Each group has a leader. So for the boys, we keep men to lead them. For the girls, we keep girls to lead them. We keep our, our responsible women to keep eyes on the girls, and then they sleep with them, and then that's it. So, but I feel it's not really secure to keep boys on this side and then girls next door. So you know, kids, they think that they're smart. So instead of keeping it like that, I was uh, telling, uh, let's say, Alan, 
So I plan on putting the boys down in there. The church. Not, not in the church. Oh. I'm going to show you. So where they can sleep down there and then up here will be only girls. Yes. That's it. Good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Master. This is a, a, a bedroom. It'll have bunk beds in it. This is where the boys will sleep to separate the boys from the girls who will be on the other side of the orphanage. And this building was uh, a product of Colonial's giving uh, in the fall of 2010. Yes. yes. One of the things that I want to make sure that Colonial understands is that God has positioned Joseph as a pastor, as the leader of the orphanage, and a general contractor, so that when we invest in this particular orphanage, we're very blessed because he does all of the work at cost. He, all of his labor is at cost, the materials are at cost, and so we get a lot more bang for our buck, if you will, by investing in this, in this particular orphan project because of the fact that and it has a need for infrastructure. It's not at the point of infrastructure that uh, the orphanage was where we were at uh, earlier this week. There's a lot of aluminum roofs in Haiti now following the earthquake, and um, that's probably a, a good development in the construction over there. But I just wanted you to be able to get a picture in your mind that when you give to support the Global Orphan Project uh, for Colonial here and all these things, and we're sending trips and you, you hear about it, there's real progress that's being made that's bringing a lot of hope and care uh, to these kids that the Lord loves very much. And I just wanted you to see that. Finally, the fourth place I saw Christ at work was in me. You know, and you're like, well, you're a pastor. Yeah, but it's, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that every single person on the team, when we got there, you know, it's, it's easy to feel a little helpless, like I don't know what I can do. But before long, Christ begins to work through the uniqueness and the giftedness of every single person on that team. Because when we show up to where Christ is already at work, he just puts us in. And, and it begins to make a change in us. You know, every good thing that came out of that trip came as a result of Christ. But by the end of the trip, you always hear this when, when you take groups on the mission field. We thought we were coming as wealthy people to help poor people, but what we really discovered was that we were the recipients. And that through these orphans and through these incredible church leaders, we, we were exposed to a love that we had not known. We were exposed to a group of people who have such a deep faith in Jesus Christ that they have lost everything, and yet... Their faith is very strong, and they have tremendous joy. We've been exposed to children who have nothing. They have no family, they have no parents, they have no material positions, and yet they laugh, and they play, and they sing, and they, and they worship God, and they study hard as though they don't have a care in the world. How does that happen? It happens because of Jesus Christ. Because he said, this is what I will be doing. If you want to find me, I'll be over here preaching good news to the poor and setting captives free. And that is exactly what Christ is doing. He continues to do that. He continues to accomplish his mission through his church. And I'm standing here this morning to tell you that he is accomplishing that mission through this church, through Colonial. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you. And I want to prod you on because our work is not done. The mission continues to go on. And so I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you individually to begin to pray about taking a trip to Haiti or one of our other sites around the world. It will change your life. My job as your pastor is to try to help you to grow and to develop into spiritually mature disciples of Christ. And I can tell you in my own life that could only go so far without entering into the mission field. It will move you to a place you have not been in your faith and understanding of what God is doing in the world. And I strongly encourage you if you are able, if, if, if you are healthy enough to simply go on one of these short trips, it'll change your life. And if you can't go, would you consider making it possible for others to go? Would you consider 
uh, sponsoring one of our teens and helping out next week with the fundraiser? Would you make a gift to the Global Orphan Project here at Colonial to help us continue to expand the influence of Christ into the lives of orphans all over the world? And most importantly, will you pray? Will you pray for these orphans? Can I tell you something? If you go, what you'll find is that some of these children speak three languages, they're brilliant, they're extremely talented, and what suddenly came to my mind is that we might be co-conspirators with God in raising up a generation that's gonna transform that country. I really actually believe that to the core of my soul. And so, these kids need our prayers, they need our love and, 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 and whatever resources we can get to it, but if you will just go, they will pay you back in space, simply for you to see how Christ is working so visibly in one of the most unlikely places in the world. Will you pray for the Global Orphan Project, its leaders, and all the partnering churches and organizations around the world who have a heart for orphans, and will you covenant to pray, finally, that Christ will accomplish his messianic mission through us? Will you pray with me now? Lord, I thank you for this great gift and opportunity you gave me to go and experience just the love of Christ in a beautiful but devastated country amongst a beautiful but very challenged group of people. Thank you for inspiring my faith with their faith. Thank you for increasing the size of my heart by exposing me to the heart of these children. Thank you for encouraging me with a new vision and a new determination based upon the compelling vision and determination of pastors on the ground in Haiti. And Lord, I pray that this vision will catch and that people here today and all over within the sound of my voice will make a decision to become available for you and to go to the place that scares them, that they might see how you are accomplishing your mission in powerful ways and in unusual and, and difficult places. Father, I pray that you'll continue to mobilize this great church called Colonial and that you will use us and in, in everything we have to accomplish your mission. We thank you for saving us and rescuing us and making us part of your story. And I pray that we'll be faithful in our part. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.